If you are in your 30s and you want to figure out how you can start investing, it is not too late, but you need to get started ASAP because there are three factors that will determine how wealthy you will become. Number one is how much money you invest. Number two is the return that you get on your money. And number three is the time, meaning how long that you can invest your money for. So for example, if you invest $300 a month and you can get a 10% annual return on your money and you do this for 30 years, you might be able to retire with $650,000. But now let's change it up a little bit. If you can invest the same $300 a month, you get the same 10% annual return. But now instead of 30 years, you invest for 35 years. Now you'll be able to retire with over $1 million. Now, the one thing you can't do with time is go back. You can work on increasing how much money you invest by working to earn more money, and you can increase how much return you get depending on how you invest your money and your financial education, but you cannot change how much time you had ahead of you. This is where now it is so important to get started today. And that's why I want to go over a couple of different investing strategies that you can start considering. Now, again, I am not a licensed financial advisor. If you have questions, talk to a licensed advisor in your area. But there are two general categories of investments that you can make, especially in the United States. Number one is by using a tax deferred retirement account. And number two is by using a taxable retirement account. A tax deferred retirement account would be doing something like a 401k, a 403b, a 457b, or an IRA. Now, for all intents and purposes, a 401k, 403b, 457b all work essentially the same, and I'm going to lump them all together, and then I'm going to talk about the IRA. The whole idea behind these tax-deferred retirement accounts is you're going to get a couple benefits. Number one is you get the benefit of getting some tax deferrals, and number two is you get the potential benefit of an employer matching your investment. Meaning, if you put $1,000 into your 401k, your employer might give you an extra $250, maybe an extra $500, maybe an extra $1,000 just for contributing money into your 401k. So if you get that benefit of an employer match, there's a lot of power, so it's kind of like free money that you're getting by doing that. But there's a lot of cons with 401ks and IRAs, but I'm going to get to that a little bit after. But this is a great place to start especially for a beginner investor. If your goal is just to build up this retirement fund, start by putting the money that your employer is matching. So if your employer is matching you up to a certain amount, do that at least to get started. And then you can decide later on if this is something you want to continue with or not, but get started at least with that employer match. Now, the whole idea between a four, the idea with a 401k or an IRA is you get this benefit of being tax deferred. And what that means is either you can pay taxes today and not pay taxes in the future, or you cannot pay taxes today and then pay taxes in the future. So if you go out and you get a traditional 401k, you don't have to pay any taxes today on the money that you invest. So if you got paid $1,000, you put all $1,000 into the 401k, it's a traditional 401k, you don't have to pay any taxes on the $1,000 that you invest. On all the rest of your income, you got to pay taxes on it. So now instead of paying, say, $200 in taxes, you get to invest all $1,000. Now this $1,000 can grow over the course of your career. And then when it comes time for you to retire at 65, 67, 70, however old you might be, now you get to pull this money out. Because you started with more money, the goal is that you're going to have a bigger nest egg because you don't have to pay any taxes in the beginning. But then on the back end, you're going to have to pay taxes when you pull this money out. So if that $1,000 becomes $2,000, now you got to pay taxes on all $2,000. Now, the question is, how much are you going to pay in taxes? And this is where it's a little bit of a question mark, because on one hand, the idea, the thing that everybody says is you are going to have less income when you retire. So your taxable income is going to be lower, right? Because we have a marginal tax rate. The more money you make, the higher tax rate is. And so everybody says, well, when you're 65 or 70 years old, you're not working. So you're not going to have a lot of income. So your income is going to be lower. So your tax rate will be lower. On the flip side, you don't know what the tax rates are going to be when you're 65 or 70 years old, because, well, there's a good chance that tax rates could potentially go up. Why? Because number one, the United States government has a massive amount of national debt. Number two, we're still running a pretty large government deficit, meaning we're spending more money than we're bringing in. And so 
all these things could contribute to the government needing more tax dollars in order to continue funding their operations. And the third thing, which is probably one of the biggest factors for me, is why would I want to have less income when I'm older? If I work to build my investments correctly, I'm going to have way more income in the future because I'm working, even if it's not my own business. I'm going to just assume that I don't have a business right now. I'm going to be working to stack my investments, to stack my cash flow. Every year, I'm working to build more and more and more cash flow. I am buying more cash flow producing assets year after year after year, which means by the time I'm 65, I'm not hoping I'm going to have no income. I'm hoping I'm having a lot of income, which means I would have a big taxable income. Now, that's me. You got to figure out what is going to be the best situation for you. That's how a traditional IRA or traditional 401k works. The Roth is a little bit different. With the Roth, if you wanted to invest $1,000 into your 401k or IRA, the first thing you're going to do is pay taxes on this money. So if your effective tax rate is 20%, you make $1,000, but $200 to the IRS. Now $800 gets invested. Now with this $800 gets invested, this money can grow. And if it again doubles to $1,600, now you get to pull this money out generally tax-free. Now, in the other example, you had to pull, you got to pull out $2,000, but then had to pay taxes on it. In this case, you pulled out $1,600, but don't have to pay taxes on it. And the question is, which one is going to be better for you? Would you rather have $1,600 tax-free or $2,000 as taxable? And this is really a question of personal preference because, again, we don't know what tax rates are going to be in the future. Are they going to be higher or are they going to be lower? And second, what is your income going to look like? Are you planning on having way more income in the future or are you planning on having less income in the future? That's the first question you have to ask for yourself. The second thing when it comes into the actual like how-tos of investing in your 401k or your IRA is where can you actually invest your money? When you invest your money into a 401k, a company-sponsored retirement plan, you're generally, especially if you're working for a smaller company, going to be limited to where you can invest your money. So you're going to have generally limited investment options. And sometimes you might be stuck into paying really high fees for your investments, which means if you are somebody who likes managing your investments, you like investing your money yourself, you might not have the same investment opportunities. You might have to pay higher fees. You might not have the same return potential as if you invested this money yourself. So this is where, again, I'm not saying don't go out and do this. Get started. This is an easy way for you to get started with your investments. And it's an easy way to get some free money with the help of your employer match. Get started here. As you start with your 401k or your IRA, then I want you to start doing your other investments on the side and figure out what you like better. Now, IRAs are a little bit different than 401ks. I'm still going to talk about them. But this is where start with your 401k, see what you like, see what you don't like, and see if there are better opportunities for you elsewhere. With the IRA, you tend to have more flexibility because an IRA is not through your employer. It, the IRA is something that you get to control yourself. So you generally have more investment opportunities. You have traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs that work the same way as a 401k. But with an IRA, you have the ability to be much more hands-on with your investments. You also have some IRAs that will allow you to invest in real estate because Pretty much all 401ks and most IRAs will require you to invest that money somewhere, somehow in the stock market. But there are some exemptions in IRAs that will allow you to invest your money into real estate. So you have a little bit more flexibility there. And now it's just a matter of figuring out, is the tax deferred benefits with an IRA worth it for you or not? Now, again, I'm not a huge fan of the tax deferred retirement accounts because I like being able to control my investments and I like the ability to touch my investments and I like the ability to get the cash flow today. That's just the way that I look at it. So for me, those tax benefits are not necessarily worth it because I'm also a big fan of real estate investing and real estate provides some of the biggest and best tax benefits that our tax code has to offer. And I can tell you this as an attorney who is not your attorney, but real estate allows you to, number one, generate cash flow on your investments because now I can go out and buy a property. I can buy a single family home. I can buy an apartment complex. I can buy a mixed use building, but I can buy this building that I will then rent out to other people. 
when other people live in or use my property, I will get rental income. Now, if I do it correctly, this rental income will pay for my expenses. It'll pay for my property taxes, my insurance, my mortgage, my maintenance fees, my management fees, and any debt, if there is any, and then put some money in my pocket. Now, generally, this income that I get is taxable, but real estate has this special exemption called depreciation, which says that because your property is one year older, you get a tax write-off on your income. So now you might get to say, hey, IRS, I generated, say, $10,000 in income from this property. But then you get to subtract this depreciation. Now, the amount of money you subtract is going to depend on how big the property is. But this is where you hear of some very successful real estate investors making millions of dollars a year paying little to no money in taxes legally. It's because of the depreciation deduction. Because they made income, they have their money in their bank account, but then they get to tell the IRS, because my property is a year older, I deserve this write-off. Even if the property value is going up, you get to still take this depreciation deduction. That's what the tax code says. And so now you can generate money and pay little to no money in taxes legally. And then the second benefit of real estate investing on the tax side is let's assume that you buy a property for $100,000 and you own this property for a number of years. The area begins to boom and now this property is worth $200,000 and you sell it. You just made $100,000 of profit. Now, generally, again, if you made $100,000 by selling an investment, that's taxable income. But with real estate, you have another tax deduction. This is called the 1031 exchange, which says, you made $100,000 in profit by selling your property. If you take all of this $200,000, and this can be any amount of money, but if you take all this $200,000 and now you go out and buy a bigger property that's going to pay with more cash flow, you don't have to pay a penny in taxes today. And you can keep doing this again and again and again every year until you die and never have to pay a penny in this capital gain appreciation taxes. So now you bought a property for $100,000, sold it for 200000 Then you could do it again. You buy a property for 200000 sell it for 400000 You sell that for 400000 or 800000 Now you keep flipping and flipping and flipping, and pretty soon, a number of years later, you're now in the millions of dollars, and it all started with your small $100,000 investment. Now, it's not always going to be sunshine and rainbows. There's a lot of headaches that are involved with real estate investing, but that's the idea that you can get a lot of tax, break with real, tax breaks with real estate investing. So now, you have the tax-deferred retirement accounts, which are the most accessible way for somebody to start investing. And this is where I would recommend that pretty much everybody start because it takes the least effort. So get started here. But what I want you to remember is that this is not where your retirement planning should end. Even if you have a 401k and an IRA, I still want you now to invest in addition to that into the taxable retirement accounts because now... This is where you're going to be able to build true and real wealth. Most people assume that, oh, I'm putting some money into my 401k. I'm getting my employer match. I'm all set. I'm ready for retirement. Well, you're going to be in for a rude awakening because that's not going to be enough. You are going to have to invest your money yourself if you want to be able to retire wealthy and be able to live your life the way you want financially. So now, what is a tax, a bull, retirement account? Well, the first option, which I just talked about, is real estate. Now, the pros with real estate are everything that I just discussed. You get the tax benefits, you get the cash flow, you own a hard asset. But the cons with real estate are, well, it takes a lot of money to start investing in real estate. If you have $5,000 to invest, it's going to be very difficult for you to go and buy a property yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get exposure to real estate because if you have a few thousand dollars, you can invest in crowdfunded real estate. You can invest in real estate syndicate deals, which means essentially you are getting exposure to somebody else's real estate deal. The way that you can do this is go to any real estate investor conference in your area. They happen all around the country. There's always going to be investors, developers there looking for money. Always. People are always looking for money to fund their deals. And if you invest in one of their deals, you're going to get a small piece of ownership in somebody else's deal. And if that deal grows and makes money, you're going to get your share of the profits. Of course, there's risk. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. But that's one way for you to get exposure to real estate without owning the real estate and buying it all yourself. One way to get started. The second way 
that you can invest your money into taxable retirement accounts would be through the stock market. Now, just like with anything else, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. And you can go from very simple to much more complex. And if you just want to get started on the simple side, you can be a passive investor in the stock market. And this is where I believe that 90 to 95, maybe even 98% of Americans should be. Because as a passive investor, what you're doing now is you're going to set up a system where every week or every two weeks or every month, every time you get paid, some money is going to automatically be invested into the market. And you're not investing in individual companies. You're not investing into Amazon or Tesla. You are investing in America. Now, all you got to do is every time you get paid, you're just going to buy a little bit more of America, period. And the way this works is you are going to buy some ETFs or index funds. These are funds that give you exposure not to one company, but to a group of companies. For example, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just an example. You can go out and invest in something like VTI. VTI is an ETF that gives you exposure to the total stock market. It's called a total stock market ETF. So now when you go out and you invest in that one ETF, you're getting exposure to our stock market. Well, what is in the stock market? The companies that make America, America. The big American companies, that's what's on the stock market. So now when you buy VTI, you're buying a piece of the stock market. Another one is SPY. SPY gives you exposure to the S&P 500. What is the S&P 500? Well, it is a group of the 500 largest companies on the stock market. So when you go out and you buy one share of SPY, you're buying a little piece of the 500 largest companies on the stock market in America. So now, if you were to build an ETF portfolio or an index fund portfolio, every week or every two weeks, or every month, some of your money is going to be pulled out of your checkings account when you get paid, and it's going to automatically be invested into America. Now, over the years, because it's not something you're going to do for six months, you're going to do this for years, if not decades, you're just going to keep buying a little bit more of America. That way now, as the American economy grows, your investment portfolio also grows. That's what passive investing is. I do passive investing. I have two strategies when I invest my money. One is passive investing, where every week I have some money that leaves my check-ins account and is automatically invested. Now, I invest into a lot of different types of ETFs. I invest into cash flow producing ETFs, to value ETFs, into emerging market ETFs, into innovation ETFs. So I have a whole portfolio of ETFs that I invest in, but you just got to get started. The mistake that so many people make is not that they invest their money into the wrong sector or into the wrong industry or into the wrong group or into the wrong expense ratio fund. It's that they never start investing. And once you get started, guess what? You can always adjust your investment portfolio. You can always adjust your ETFs. You can always adjust your ratios. But you can't adjust getting started, so you got to get started first. So now I have this passive strategy that works for me, and then I also have an active strategy. My active strategy is now where I'm investing into individual companies. This is a lot more work. This is where most people think it's, I'm going to find the next Amazon, and I'm just going to throw my money into that. Or you try to find the next Tesla, and you try to throw your money into that. For me, this is, I'm looking for what I believe are good companies, that are undervalued that I want to hold on to for the long term. And this isn't a guessing game. This is much more of a research intensive game where I like to research companies and researching companies is more of the, the feeling side. This is now I'm looking at who's running the company. What is the product? Do people like the company? What's the sentiment around the company? And what's the barrier to entry? This is what Warren Buffett calls a moat. Is it really hard for a competitor to come in and take this company's spot? Or is this company a real behemoth and they have a real brand recognition and a name recognition that's going to be very hard to compete with once you figure that out then you get into the financials you're digging into the balance sheet the balance sheet is essentially the the net worth statement of a company you look at the assets and you look at the liabilities what are their balance sheet look like what do their assets look like what do their debts look like then i look at things like the the income statement the profit and loss statement how much money did this company make last year, the year before, the year before that? What are their operating costs? Are they rising? Are they shrinking? If they're rising, why are they rising? Are they rising because 
they're investing a lot more in their company or their operating costs rising because the cost of doing business is rising. And so you have to start asking and start looking into these numbers. Then you look into the cash flow statement, which is how is money flowing through the company? What is this company doing with their cash? Are they being smart with their money or are they just getting rid of this cash and giving it away to shareholders too early? So these are the now analytical questions that you ask when you want to invest in a company. And again, you don't have to do this. Most people shouldn't be doing this. This is something that you got to be interested in. I like researching companies. I'm a money nerd, right? This is, I'm a weirdo. I like doing that. To me, I enjoy it. So I don't mind doing it. But if you don't like the idea of learning how to do that, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to spend the time to do that, if you don't have the time to do that, it's okay. You don't got to worry about doing it. You don't have to do that. The passive system is a great strategy that has been proven to build wealth decade after decade after decade. It doesn't mean that your investments are going to always go up. We see America go through recessions. We see our stock market go through market crashes. But if you invest long enough, you would have made money over the last century. And this is where now understanding, if you want to build wealth, you got to understand what your options are. The most accessible option is your retirement accounts. Get started there, but do not stop there. Your retirement accounts are not going to be enough for you to be able to live your life wealthy. Then, once you start there, you start doing the taxable accounts, stocks and real estate. And now you can make the third decision, which is, well, are these taxable accounts good for you, bad for you? It's okay if they're good. It's okay if they're bad. You just got to figure out what is the right strategy for you. And then, as you start building your investment foundation, that's when you can start looking at alternative types of investments. Now, this could be things like investing in startups. This could be things like owning a little bit of gold. This could be things like investing in potentially cryptocurrency. This is where now you can start looking at more of the speculative type of things, but you don't want to jump into these speculative investments until you built an investment foundation base. So now you start building your investment base. You have the retirement accounts. You have the, non, the taxable accounts, the non-taxable accounts. And now you can look at other things. I like investing in startups. I'm an entrepreneur. I like working with other entrepreneurs. I like researching these types of companies. I like investing in these companies, but it's very risky. Investing in startups is, well, you're going to lose money. Eight to nine out of 10 startups will fail or go bankrupt within the first five years. Statistics tell us that. So if you were to go out and invest in a handful of startups, most of them will fail. The goal is that you're going to hit one that will make up for all the losses. Will that happen? Who knows? But that's part of the game. I think it's fun. I also like the financial potential upside with it. And it's a learning game for me. It's something that I enjoy doing. Besides that, I also invest in cryptocurrency. Now, I have use with cryptocurrency. I've talked about how I use cryptocurrency to pay some of my contractors that are overseas. I like the power of the blockchain. But there's a lot of people that jump into cryptocurrency thinking they're going to get rich by buying some cryptocurrency and having it just pop overnight. That's why you see such huge volatility in cryptocurrency. That's why you see some people make a ton of money in cryptocurrency. And that's why you see most people lose their money in cryptocurrency. So if you're going to invest in cryptocurrency, number one, make sure you can lose all that money. You're okay losing that. But then second, also understand what is it that you're buying? Are you comfortable with that investment? And are you comfortable investing in it for the long term? Number three, you can also look at owning precious metals, something like gold. I own gold. Gold makes up a small piece of my portfolio. It's about 2% of my entire investment portfolio. Why do I invest in gold? I look at it like a way to save hard money. If I were to go out and take $10,000 with the gold and $10,000 with the cash and bury it in my backyard today, my theory is that 10 years from now, the gold is going to have more buying power. So I own a little bit of gold. But it's not a huge piece of my portfolio. My gold doesn't generate me any cash flow. And I don't sit here and monitor the price of gold. It's just an alternative way for me to save money. It's another small piece of my investment portfolio. So now, when you build your investment portfolio, understand the investments that have been around a long time, that have been proven to build wealth. Make that the bulk of your investments. And then as you master that, you can start looking at other alternative investments. But start with the things that have been proven. Stocks and real estate and then you can start diversifying it to some of the other asset classes as well. There are some investments that can make you money very quickly. We saw that happen with Amazon and Apple and Tesla during the tech boom. 
And then there are other investments that you want to own for life because these are things that can build you generational wealth. When you spend money most of the time, you are a consumer. Like if you go out to McDonald's and you buy a burger and you buy some fries and you eat it, you are consuming their products. When you invest your money, you become a producer. Now instead of you being the person that's buying the burgers, you're the one that's selling the burgers. Speaking of McDonald's, one way to do that is by actually investing in and buying one of the McDonald's franchises. Now you own a McDonald's store, so if people are buying McDonald's sandwiches from you, you're the one making money. The other way you can do that is by investing in the McDonald's corporation, the actual stock. If you go onto the stock market and you buy one share of McDonald's, you become one of the owners of McDonald's. Now, if you just own one share of McDonald's, you're not going to get to tell them what to do and how to run their business, but you do get to share in the profits when McDonald's makes money. Now, the difference between being a real investor and being a flipper or a trader is how long you plan on owning your investment for. Like if you stick with McDonald's, if you plan on just buying and selling their stock in three months to make a quick profit, you're not an investor, you're a trader. If you plan on owning this investment for longer than a year, now you're classified as an investor. So if we draw this out, when you invest your money, you are using your money to be a producer, not just a consumer. Remember, when you're a consumer, you're just eating the product or using the product. When you're the producer, you're the one that's making money off of the product. So you're investing in being a producer, and when you invest your money, you have a time span of having your money invested for at least one year. What I wanna talk about in this video is not just your regular investments. I want to talk about the investments you should be holding for your entire life because they're a little bit different than what you might think. I'm going to be going over five different investment types in this video, so make sure you watch this video until the end. But before I get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below because the way the YouTube algorithm works, if you do not smash that thumbs up button, then YouTube is much less likely to show you and other people our financial news and education videos. The first is real estate for residential purposes for reasons that you might not expect. Now, when I say real estate for residential purposes, I mean real estate where people live in. So this can be homes or apartments. I'm not calling it residential real estate because when people say residential real estate, that typically means we're talking about single family homes or small multifamily units up to four different units. When I say real estate for residential purposes, this can mean single family homes or this can mean big apartment complexes where people live in. The way real estate investing works is like this. Let's say you find this house right here on sale for $100,000 and you go through the property and you think it's a good property in a good area. So then you come in, so I'm gonna draw you right here and I'm gonna draw you with a nice mustache of course. You come in and you buy this property for $100,000. Now you own this home right here, but you're not gonna live in this home yourself. Instead, what you do is you are going to lease this home out to this person right here and maybe their family and they're going to live in your property but in exchange of this person living in your property they're going to pay you one thousand dollars a month in rent every single month for them living in your property now you can continue working your job like normal or you can go on vacation or do whatever you got to do and you will continue making this one thousand dollars a month every single month because this person needs a place to live and where are they living they are living in your home the reason i say you want to own real estate for residential purposes for life is because people will always need a place to stay no matter what happens in technology and no matter what happens in the future people will always need a home you can compare that to the past where people used to look at shopping malls and strip plazas as the thing to own in real estate. Well, as technology came and Amazon came and the shopping dynamic of the world changed, then shopping malls didn't become as attractive. There were people who made a ton of money in the strip mall and the shopping mall business. But now that industry is kind of dying because the whole shopping industry is changing. Same with office real estate. Real estate investors back in the day used to say that companies will always need a place to work. But then came the 2020 pandemic and then people realized that they can work from home which made office real estate not so attractive. Residential real estate is a little bit different because people will always need a roof over their heads. People will always need a bed to sleep on and people will always need a home to stay in. That makes it a lot easier for you to own real estate for the rest of your life because the only reason people won't want a home to live in is if people decide that they're more comfortable living on the streets. Now let's talk about why or why you don't want to own real estate for the rest of your life. So for the sake of this example, let's say over here you have a single family home and here you have an apartment complex both of which you can buy for one million dollars and let's assume for the sake of this example that if you rented out both of these properties after paying all of your expenses you would be left 
with $70,000 at the end of a year. So you buy each one of these and each one of these make you, let's just say $200,000 a year in rental income. And then you pay for all of your expenses, your property tax, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees. After paying all of your expenses, you are left with $70,000 worth of profit. And we're assuming that there's no debt. You're buying these properties with cash only. That means both of these properties are paying you a 7% annual return because here you're buying this house for a million dollars and you're making $70,000 a year in rental income profits. And here you're buying this apartment complex for a million dollars and you're making $70,000 a year in profits. But you also have to remember that just because you made $70,000 doesn't mean you get to keep $70,000 because the IRS wants their cut. You gotta pay taxes on this money. However, real estate does come with some legal tax loopholes. When you own real estate, as an investment, meaning you're not the one living here. You are renting out your property to somebody else and you get to tell the IRS, hey, this property that I own is one year older, so I deserve a tax break called the depreciation deduction on my taxes. And so you get to take a tax break on both of this income right here because you own investment real estate. But the size of your deduction is gonna be different here and here because this single family home is considered residential real estate and this apartment complex is considered commercial real estate. Residential real estate, so single family homes, two families, three families, and four family units, let you depreciate your property for 27 and a half years, while commercial real estate, so anything over four units, lets you depreciate this property over 30 39 years. I'm gonna explain what this means. So now what you're gonna do is you are gonna take the value of this building, not the land, the building itself, and divide it by the number of years that you can depreciate it on your taxes. So for the sake of these examples, let's assume that when you buy this $1 million property, $200,000 of which is going towards the land value because you know these properties sit on some land and $800,000 is for the building. So you're paying $200,000 for the land that this property is on and $800,000 is for the actual building. Once you know that, now you can do $800,000 divided by 27 and a half, which is one second, $800,000 divided by 27 and a half, $29,000. So over here, you get a $29,000 tax break every year for 27 and a half years. And over here, $800,000 divided by 39. This is about $20,000. So here, you get a $20,000 tax break every single year for 39 years. What this allows you to do now is you buy this property, you make $70,000 a year, but you only pay taxes on $79,000 minus $29,000, so right around $41,000. You're only paying taxes on $41,000 worth of income for the first 27 and a half years. After 27 and a half years, you don't get this deduction anymore. Same thing here. Here, you make $70,000, but you only tell the IRS that you made $50,000 and you get to do that for 39 years. After 39 years, you don't get that deduction anymore, which is why a lot of people invest in real estate, but they have the goal of never holding it longer than 27 and a half or longer than 39 years. However, you also get some benefits if you own real estate for your entire life. So this is the reason why you wouldn't want to own real estate for your entire life because after 27 and a half years or after 39 years, you no longer get this tax break and so now you have to pay more money in taxes. And so if you don't want to pay more money in taxes, you might want to sell your property after 27 and a half years or after 39 years. That way you can take advantage of all these real estate tax breaks. However, let's go over why you might want to own real estate for your entire life. So now, same example. You buy either one of these properties for $1 million and you own it for some time and you're making rental money every single year. But now a few years go by and you find out that your property is now worth $5 million. So you got a lot of equity in this property because you bought it for $1 million and now it's worth $5 million. And now you're thinking, yeah, I want to give this property or this money to my kids. Now, one thing that you can do is you can sell this property and get $5 million worth of cash, but now you have millions of dollars worth of profit because you bought this property for $1 million and you're selling it for $5 million. So you're gonna have a pretty big tax bill where you're gonna have to give a big chunk of this money to the IRS in taxes. The alternative, assuming you do not sell this property for cash when you're alive and you own these properties, either one, until you die. Now, when you die, your estate gives this property, either one, to your heirs, your kids. Now what happens is your kid is gonna get this property and the government is going to say that your kid got the property, they bought it for $5 million. So if your kid went out and they sold this property today for $5 million after you die, they will get this $5 million of cash 
and they don't have to pay any taxes on this money because to the government, it looks like they bought the property for $5 million. This concept is called stepped up basis, and essentially what it's saying is if you die with this property, then the person you give this property to essentially can say that they bought the property for how much it's worth when you die. So now if you get here, you don't have to worry about selling your property for a profit and then paying taxes and then giving this cash to your kid. What you can do is let this property live with you for the rest of your life and then when you die, you give this property to your kid and now what you have to worry about is estate taxes but you get a much bigger kind of cushion with estate taxes because you have to be gifting millions of dollars before any estate taxes come into play. Now I do gotta let you know, although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. So if you have specific tax questions or legal questions, talk to a professional in your area. The last reason why I say real estate is an investment that you wanna own for your entire life is because with real estate, you own something tangible that you can see, feel, and touch. And this is something that can continue to provide you income and income growth for the rest of your life because if there's demand for this property, wherever it is, then what you're gonna see happen is more people are gonna wanna live there, which means the rent that you charge can go up too. So now as things become more expensive because of inflation, the amount of money you make every single year also increases because there's more demand to live in the property that you own. Second thing you wanna own for life is the stock market in general. And when I say the stock market in general, I don't mean investing in stocks the way most people talk about investing in stocks. I talk a lot about investing on a YouTube channel from real estate investing to stock market investing, which is why if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, you should do that. But when most people talk about stock market investing, they're trying to find the next hot stock. How can you find the next Tesla or the next Amazon or the next Apple before it makes it big? Now you can make a lot of money if you find the next hot stock, but that might not be something you wanna own for the rest of your life because well, Tesla could fail. Amazon could go bankrupt, and people might stop liking iPhones. Now I know what you're probably thinking, oh, just but Amazon can't ever fail. They're a powerhouse. How could anything be bigger than Amazon? Well, that's exactly what people used to think about Sears. Sears used to be the monster retailer, and back in the day, people used to think that there would never be a Sears competitor because they were so huge. Well, now times have changed, technology has changed, and Sears is bankrupt. Companies will change, technology will change, people will change, but one thing, if you believe in the United States and if you believe in the American economy, one thing that won't change is the economy. So if you believe in the American economy, what you want to be betting on is the American economy because while companies like Sears might come and fail and JCPenney might come and fail and Circuit City might come and fail and Hertz might come and fail and California Pizza Kitchen might come and fail, the American economy has continued to grow. The closest way for you to get actual exposure to the American economy is to invest in the broader stock market as a whole, and that would be through funds like VOO and SPY. These are two different ETFs, exchange traded funds, which allow you to invest in the broader stock market because both of these funds give you exposure to the top 500 companies in the United States. So both of these funds give you exposure to the S&P 500. Now I wanna give you a little caveat here because the United States economy and the stock market are similar, but two different things. The economy is the economy. This is our companies, and this is how many people have jobs, and this is how well our economy is doing. The stock market is where people bet their money based off of how well they think the economy is doing. So while they're similar, they are different because when people put their money in the stock market, they're betting that the economy is gonna do well in the future. The way you invest in these funds is the same way you invest in any other company. You just go onto your stock brokerage and then buy these funds as opposed to buying something like Tesla or Amazon. Now, I should also remind you that when you invest your money, you are never guaranteed to make money. You might even lose money when you invest, which is why you should always, always, always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. But when you invest in funds like these, now what you're doing is you are essentially betting on the growth of the American economy. You're not trying to get rich overnight. You are just betting on the slow and steady growth of the economy. If the economy is growing and our companies are growing and companies are making more money, well then chances are these funds are gonna continue to make you more money too. By the way, if you do wanna learn more about how to actually invest your money in the stock market and grow your money and find a good stock brokerage to use, our team put together a very comprehensive article that goes over all of that and you can read it on our website, theminoritymindset.com and I'll also link it for you in the description below. The advantage with owning something like this for the rest of your life is now you don't gotta worry about changing trends because like I said before, companies will change, people will change, and technology will change. 
but the economy will continue to grow. So as companies come and go, these funds will kick out the companies that are not doing too good and they will add in the companies that are doing better. So if a company is no longer one of the top 500 companies, it will get kicked out of these funds and then these funds will add in a new company who is now one of the top 500 companies. Now the difference between owning something like this and owning real estate is with real estate, typically you're investing in real estate for passive income. So you're going to make investing decisions based off of how much money you're making every single month. Here, you do get some passive income from dividends but it's not going to be as much as the amount of passive income you're getting from real estate. However, you do get the stepped up basis here like you did in real estate. So if you invest $1 million here and over your lifetime this goes up to $5 million, well, you could sell your investment and pay taxes and then give this money to whoever you want to give it to or you can own these investments for the rest of your life and if you don't have to use this money and you die with these assets, well now they can go to your kids or whoever you want it to go to and they will own these assets and when they sell it, if they sell it for $5 million, which is how much it's worth when you die, they won't have to pay any capital gains taxes on that. The third thing you want to own for life is gold with an asterisk because this should be a small part of your portfolio. No more than 5-10% to of your entire portfolio because gold is not there to make you wealthy. It is there to protect you against a worst case scenario type of situation. Your stocks and your real estate are what you own to fund your retirement, to create more passive income, and to build your wealth. Your gold is almost like financial insurance. It is there to protect you against something horrible happening in the economy. There's a few different ways that you can invest in gold. You can invest in companies that mine in gold. Now you're not actually investing in gold, you're investing in companies that mine in gold. And as gold prices go up, these companies make more money because there's more of a demand for gold. Or the second thing you can do is invest in gold certificates. So now you're investing almost like gold stocks. You're investing in a fund that gives you exposure to actual gold. So a company owns physical gold and now you're investing in a fund that this company created which gives you exposure to their actual gold. So it's a little bit of a derivative but it gives you exposure to physical gold and the third thing that you can do is invest in physical gold bars. So if we're talking about owning gold, the ideal thing to do is own the physical gold bars because that gives you the most insurance because this is something you can see, feel and touch and it's something that you can control. Again, this should not be a huge part of your portfolio and this should not be something you're stressing about. And if you don't have any other investments, you should not be worried about buying gold right now. The first thing you need to be worried about is buying the real estate, buying the stocks, buying the things that are actually going to make you money. Once you establish yourself and once you have some real financial assets, that's when you can think about adding some gold, remember asterisk, adding some gold to your portfolio. Gold comes in handy in worst case scenario type of situations. So when we talked about investing in stocks, we're betting on the American economy because if the economy continues to grow, well then the stock market is going to grow. But if the economy completely fails and our dollar becomes worthless and people have no money, well this is where gold could have value. Gold is the original currency and a lot of people believe that if the dollar were to fail then people would revert back to gold. If you remember back during the Great Depression there were countries in the world that saw hyperinflation where people would have to take literally a wheelbarrow full of cash in order to afford a loaf of bread because then gold became so expensive. And so the thought is if the worst case scenario type of situation happened and the economy crashes and the dollar goes to nothing, well then people will go back to things like gold because this is a tangible currency and this was the original currency. You know, people have been betting on a doomsday situation like that for decades and decades and decades and to date they've been wrong every single time which is why you want to make sure you're investing in your wealth first, but you always want to protect yourself because yeah, there's a chance that things could go really bad, which is why you want to own some gold. Going along with that, the fourth thing you want to consider owning for the rest of your life is some cryptocurrency. So this is what's considered the new digital gold. Gold was the original currency and many people believe that cryptocurrency and blockchain will be involved in our future currency. Now look, there's a lot of speculation around cryptocurrency and there's a lot of guessing around what cryptocurrency will be in the future and nobody can predict the future which is why again we got this asterisk here because this needs to be a small percentage of your portfolio, okay? This is not something you want to bet your entire life savings on. This is something where you want to put some money because there's a lot of potential with cryptocurrency and there's a lot of potential of a blockchain, however, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. Again, this should not be your first investment. Get the things that are proven first out of the way. Own your stocks, own your real estate, own the things that are going to make you wealthy and pay you with passive income. 
Then once you do that, you can put some money here. And fifth, the last investment we're talking about that you want to own for life are commodities that you need to survive. So one way to kind of think about this is you might have heard examples of super wealthy people and rich people that have these bunkers in their homes that protect them against any nuclear blast. And inside of these bunkers, they have food and rations that will survive them for years. Now, I'm not saying you need to spend a million dollars building an underground bunker below your home, but you should consider investing in some commodities that people will need to survive. So one example of this is water. If you've ever seen the movie The Big Short, great movie by the way, which talks about the 2008 real estate collapse, at the end of the movie, they talked about how this guy was investing in water because we have a limited supply of water in the world and our demand and our needs for water keep going up. We need water in order to survive. It's a commodity to survive. And so this is not something that's gonna make you rich overnight, but if the demand and the need for water go up and our supply of water is limited, well, this could create a real problem in the future. And so you want to be kind of a proactive thinker and start thinking about things on how to take care of yourself and your finances in this case. And one way that you can get exposure to that is by investing in, again, companies that clean or store water or investing in water ETFs that give you exposure to the water commodity. Another thing that you can potentially consider is look at investing in a farm, an actual farm for your family just in case because we never know what's gonna happen in the future. I mean, we have a lot of tension in the world and let's say things go bad. If you have a farm, well, now you can kind of be self-sufficient. You can grow your own food and have things to take care of yourself and take care of your family. Again, this is a commodity to survive. Is this something that's gonna make you rich overnight? No, but you're protecting yourself against anything. If you are living paycheck to paycheck and you're struggling with your money and you can't figure out how to get ahead financially, you have two options. First option is you can kick, scream, complain, and cry about it. You can talk about how your bank screwed you over, how your credit card company is keeping you in debt, how your student loans are the reason why you're broke, how your corporation is screwing you because they're not paying you enough, about how everything, how the system and everything around you is keeping you broke and is keeping you struggling because it's keeping you stuck in this system. That's option one. Option two now is you can do something about it. Now you can take a look at everything going on and you can say, you know what? Yeah, all these things suck, but there are things that I can do. There are things that are in my control and I'm gonna focus on the things that are in my control that way I can take charge of my personal finances and I am going to ignore this because I understand these things will keep happening, but they're not going to help me. And you can understand now, how can you make your personal financial situation better? Because the reality for every wealthy person, every rich person, every whatever you wanna call it, financially free person, what they have decided is, first, I'm gonna make a decision that I wanna take care of myself, I wanna take care of my family, I wanna take care of my community, and I wanna take care of my finances, which means I gotta be financially educated, and then I gotta put in the steps to make sure that I am going to be okay financially, because no matter where you are, if you are in a first world country, if you understand what I'm saying, you have the ability now to take charge of your finances, but the first thing you have to do is understand what to do, because now if you're struggling with your money, like if you're living paycheck to paycheck, the very first thing that you can do now is just learn to say no. And this is a very common thing that happens where you're working hard to save some money, you're working hard to put some cash aside, you're working hard to finally try to get out of this rat race, but something always happens. Somebody keeps having a birthday, somebody keeps getting married, somebody keeps wanting to go on a vacation, somebody keeps wanting to go out to these expensive dinners, and every time you put aside a little bit of cash, whether it's $100, $1,000, or $10,000, you find that something comes up to deplete your savings. And this is where you have to learn how to say no, because if you can't say no, then anytime something comes up, it's gonna keep draining your bank account. So you have to be able to say no. Now this is gonna be tough, because someone's gonna wanna invite you to an event. Someone's gonna wanna invite you to a nice dinner. Someone's gonna invite you to this thing that you feel like you have to go through. But this is where you gotta be willing to say no because you wanna be able to take care of your finances. If you feel obligated that if you go there, you're gonna have to pay $250 for this nice dinner, or you're gonna have to pay $200 for a gift, or you're gonna have to pay $2,000 to go on a vacation, and you don't wanna spend that money, or you can't afford to spend that money, it's okay to say no. Now, you might be saying, but Jaspreet, I wanna be able to enjoy my life. I wanna have nice memories. I wanna have this nice stuff. That's fine. I'm not saying don't have a good life. I'm not saying don't make good memories, but this is where you gotta make a decision. What's more important to you right now? Is making that memory more important to you right now? Or is building wealth more important to you right now? 
And you just got to make that decision for yourself. It's a free country. No one can tell you what to do, but if you really want to become wealthy, you got to be willing to put in the sacrifice to make those decisions. Before, when I was trying to build my wealth, I knew that I wanted to achieve something that nobody could really understand because I had this vision of wanting to build something, wanting to become successful, and I didn't know anybody else around me who had achieved this level of success that I wanted, but I was willing to do whatever it took. So when we used to go out to eat, me and my friends, we used to all go out to eat, all of my friends would order something and I would eat nothing. I would drink water and then I would go home to eat because I knew that was cheaper. Now, I like eating out now because I can afford to do that. I can afford the nicer meals, I can afford to do this where it doesn't bother me financially to do that. But before, when $100 was a bigger deal, I didn't wanna spend $50, $100 on things that I know that I could make at home for $5 or $10, so it didn't make sense to me financially because in that time, during that phase, I did not want to spend a penny that I didn't have to because I wanted to invest everything back that I could into my investments. I wanted to invest everything that I could back into my business because I wanted to pour everything back into me. Now, of course, living smaller is not fun. It is one of the least fun things to do, but if you, kind of stop, think of it as a chore and you think of it more as something that you have to get through, like a hurdle in order to achieve that success. It doesn't really become as much of a chore. Like when I was going to restaurants with my friends and I wasn't eating at the restaurants, it didn't really seem like that big of a deal. To me, I was like, man, you're eating all these calories, all this fried stuff, all this stuff that wasn't good for you. And I was like, I'm just gonna go eat at home. It's gonna be healthier and it's gonna be cheaper. Like it just kind of becomes a game, but you have to be able to kind of beat it into your mindset because you have to be wealthy here before you can be wealthy in your bank account. You have to be wealthy in your mind before you can actually be wealthy and be visibly wealthy. And this is one of the reasons why I call myself and everything that I do the minority mindset because it's all about thinking differently than the majority of people. If you are doing what everybody else is doing, then for 90% of things, it's probably wrong. And this is where you have to just understand and think about it, that if you don't want to end up like everybody else, if you don't want to live like everybody else, if you want to live a life that's different from everybody else, you can't keep doing what everybody else is doing. Because if you keep doing what everybody else is doing, you're going to end up just like everybody else. And if you keep doing what everybody else is doing and you're expecting a different result, well, that's the definition of insanity. That's a quote written by somebody else. I did not write that, but this is where you have to just be honest with yourself and understand what do you want and what are you willing to sacrifice and do to achieve what you want. Like you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. I did an interview, I forget who it was recently, where I talked about this, where a lot of people say that they wanna become wealthy. You say with your words, I want to be rich, but your actions speak much louder than your words because on one hand, you're saying, I want to be rich, and then on the second hand, you're driving a BMW, yet you have zero dollars in your investment account. You're buying Gucci, but you don't have any money in your stock portfolio. You're buying Louis Vuitton, yet you own no rental properties. And this is where you have to understand, if you're gonna be buying this nice luxury stuff, but you don't have any money in your investment portfolio, your priorities are in the wrong place. And this is where you have to understand, what do you want? Would you rather look rich or be rich? Because right now, the majority of people are trying to look rich, which is keeping them away from actually becoming rich. And you know, it's not that difficult of a concept to grasp. I think we all know that if you stopped buying nice things and you invested it instead, you'd become wealthier over the long term. But it's difficult because most of us don't have that long-term mindset where we're thinking, what's gonna happen 10 years from now? What's gonna happen 20 years from now? How am I going to be? What's my personal financial situation going to be? But this is one of those things where you have to start thinking differently if you want to actually become wealthy because now you gotta start thinking for the long term, not just six months down the road, but 10 years down the road because you are going to pass through these 10 years. And either 10 years from now, you're gonna become significantly wealthier than you are today, or you're gonna be significantly broker than you are today, or you're gonna be the same. That choice is yours. And again, you can blame everybody else. You can blame every other entity in the world for the problems that you're having, but that doesn't solve any of your problems. Like you saying that the government is keeping you broke, you saying that your corporation is keeping you broke, you saying that your boss is keeping you broke, you saying that your student loans are keeping you broke, you saying that the credit card company is keeping you broke, it doesn't do any good. 
No, we can complain about it for 10 minutes. Give yourself 10 minutes to go complain about it, cry about it, tell everybody about it, post about it on social media. Once you get it out, because it's annoying and it sucks, now it's done. Now spend the rest of your 23 hours in the day worrying about what you are going to do to actually fix your personal situation. That way now you can actually become wealthy. And the first thing that you can do now is just by saying no. Which brings me now to the second thing that you can do. Don't do more of the things that got you into this financial situation in the first place. If credit card debt got you into this situation, if your student loans are holding you back, if it is all you're spending online, then stop doing that thing that is keeping you in the situation or that got you in the situation. Stop doing that. And this might seem like common sense, but this is one of those things where sometimes you just have to kind of think about it logically and see what you have to break away from. Because if you have $10,000 worth of credit card debt, you should not be spending money on your credit card right now. If you have any sort of credit card debt, you should not be spending money on your credit card. Now you might hear that and say, but just breathe. I heard that you love spending money on your credit card and that you only use a credit card. You're right. I love using a credit card. I only use a credit card to make my transactions, but I have zero dollars with a credit card debt. Anytime I spend with my credit card, I pay off the entire balance in full every single month. That way I never have to pay a penny in interest. That way now my credit card is paying me for using it because now I get the perks, I get the cash back, I get the rewards, and I get all the other benefits of a credit card. But if I were having to pay interest, then none of these things are worth it for the credit card. And so this is where now you have to understand, if you have credit card debt, stop spending money on your credit card. Only pay with cash, pay with a debit card that we can get out of credit card debt because now you're not building your credit card debt any bigger and now you need to aggressively pay down this credit card debt as fast as possible. Like, let me just give you a quick hypothetical. If you had $6,200 when you turned 21 and you took all of this $6,200 and you invested this money somewhere and this investment could get you a 20% return a year consistently, and you did that for the course of your career, you did that from 21 until 66 years old, you would have $20 million. If not 20 million, $15 million, but you would have more than $10 million in your bank account. You would be a multi, multi-millionaire. Now you might hear that and say, Jaspreet, where in the world am I going to get a 20% consistent return on my money? Well, your credit card company is doing it every single day. They're getting that return by charging you interest on the things that you bought that you couldn't afford to pay off. And so this is where you can't get that 20% return year after year after year, but your credit card company is doing it. How are they doing it? Because of you, because of your credit card debt. So first thing, avoid using credit cards if you have any credit card debt. Stop using credit cards. Second, pay down that credit card debt as fast as possible. And this can be any sort of high interest debt. If you have hard money loans, if you have any of those buy now, pay later loans that are now charging you a super high APR with a super high fees because you didn't pay it off in time, these are the things that you need to be paying off first because anything that's charging you this high interest debt is literally skinning you alive financially. And this is where you want to be paying attention to what's going on because they don't want you to know how much these things are actually costing you because if you did, you would get much more worried, you would get angry, and you would take more action. And this is where you wanna be the one that's taking action. And how do I know this? Because right before me recording this video, I watched a speech by the Federal Reserve Bank Chairman, Jerome Powell. And what he said was, his goal is to bring inflation down. Like we know that inflation is still high right now, but his goal is to bring inflation down to levels where inflation isn't something that people notice, that it isn't something that you're factoring into your household spending decisions, that it's not something that you're factoring into your basic household conversations. So he wants to bring inflation down, not to zero, but to something that's low enough that you don't notice it. This is where his 2% goal is. Now, let me just think about that for a second, or let's just think about that for a second, because if their goal is to bring inflation down to a level where you don't really think about it, but it's still there because now that we all know that inflation makes the regular person poorer and broker every single day. Well, if inflation is low, that still means that it's making you poorer every single day because when you have inflation, it's making the value of your savings and your earnings lower. But when it's low enough that it doesn't really affect you day by day, that it's, it does not really 
bothering you that you don't notice it, that doesn't mean that it's not happening. And so that's what a lot of these institutions want to do, where they want to make something as little pain as possible, where they can just keep taking money out of your bank account to the point where it's not affecting your day-to-day -day decisions, where it's not at the top of your mind every single day. That way they can just keep taking money away from you because now they keep getting rich while you keep getting poor, but you don't even think about it. You don't even see it happen because it's not these huge $50,000 transactions. It's these small micropayments that keep so many people broke. It's the thing that keeps so many people poor, but this is where now you have to break out of that get financially educated and start making decisions that are smarter for yourself financially. Now, of course, the best thing that you can do with your money now is start putting some extra cash aside into your investments because that's how wealthy people become wealthy. Wealthy people invest their money and then they spend whatever's left. The majority of people are spending their money and then if they have anything left, they might save it or invest a little bit. So you want to flip that mindset. I'm not going to go over how to invest your money and go over all the investing strategies in this video, but if you want to learn more about investing, we have a free guide that my team put together on how you can start investing your money, even if you don't have a lot of money, and how you can start generating passive income from your investments. So if you want to read this free guide on how to generate passive income from your investments, even if you don't have a lot of money, it's completely free. And I'll put the link to how you can download this guide down in the description below. This is where now you have to understand, okay, you are spending a little bit less money, you are creating a little bit of a buffer, and now what are you doing with the money? Well, you want to invest it, but now let's talk about how do you actually just break away out of paycheck to paycheck because that investment money is what's going to make you wealthy, right? Like we've talked about this before, I have tons of videos on my channel where the wealth formula is you take your income, you subtract your expenses, and this equals your investments plus your savings. If you want to become wealthy, you have to boost your investments. If you want to have a bigger financial cushion, you boost your savings. Well, how do you do that? You can increase your income or you can decrease your expenses. Up until now, we've been talking about how do you decrease your expenses, but now let's flip gears a little bit and let's talk about how do you actually increase your income because now this can really accelerate the way that you become wealthy. Now, obviously one way that you can increase your income is by investing your money because when you invest your money, the whole idea is now you're putting your money to work to attract you more money. That's the passive way to earn more money. But if you really wanna earn more money quicker, you gotta be willing to take on more risk and you have to be willing to put in more action because now this is where you want to start developing this abundant mindset because most of us grow up with not a growth or abundant mindset, it's a, limity, it's a limited, scarce mindset where we think there's a limited amount of money in the world that if you make a dollar, I can't make a dollar, that if somebody else is getting something, I can't get something, and this is what creates envy, it's what creates jealousy, because now we're always counting what other people are getting, we're counting what other people are making, and this makes us now feel stressed, it makes us anxious, it makes us angry, because we keep seeing other people making all the money and we have nothing for ourselves. There are so many layers of toxicness that when you do that, one, it's just all this negativity, where when you're just constantly hating about what other people are doing, it just puts a whole bunch of negativity out there, which already makes it hard for you to become successful. Second, you become worried about all the wrong things. You're now worried about what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is making, and there's no focus on you and your finances. And third, when you have this type of toxic negative nature about money and success and wealth, it becomes even more difficult for you to achieve it and do it yourself. So this is where you want to break away from this toxic, scarcity, limited, broke mindset and start moving towards more of an abundant growth wealth mindset. Now, I'm not going to do a whole talk about mindset in this video, but if that's something that you struggle with, you have to take care of that and tackle that first. Because like I said earlier in this video, you have to be wealthy here before you can be wealthy in your bank account. And you might hear that and say, just Preeti, I have no idea what you're talking about because I know if I was watching this video 10 years ago, that's exactly what I would be saying. But it is 100% true. I'm telling you from my years of experience, from going from you know very little figuring it out, hustling to actually becoming wealthy, to building investments, to building businesses, to having employees and doing all of that, you have to be wealthy in your mindset first. And it's not that, hey, I think about money and money magically shows up in my bank account. That's not why I'm saying that. It's not this whole like magic where you just think happy things and happy things happen. That's not what I'm saying. 
It's understanding that mindset of appreciating success. It's understanding that mindset of there is an abundance of money out there. There's an abundance of wealth out there. There's an abundance of happiness out there. And just because somebody else has something doesn't mean that you can't have it either. And the reason why this is important because now, as you start putting your money to work, as you start investing your money, as you start building financial systems, as you start living below your means, as you start having a margin in your income. So you spend money and you earn money and you have some cash left over. This is where now you understand, oh yeah, if I just make more money, now I'll have more money to put to work. I'll have more money to build my wealth. I'll have more money to invest because now I understand what to actually do with my money. I have this financial education. Well, this is where that mindset becomes extremely either beneficial or harmful depending on what your mindset is because now maybe you're making $40,000 a year and you're putting aside 10 grand. You're putting aside 25%. But now if you want to be more aggressive, you're going to have to earn more money. And what do you do? Well, you can either, well, you have two options. You can either now live smaller. Instead of putting aside $10,000 a month, you can put aside $15,000 a month. But now you're just squeezing more pennies out of the same pie. Sure, an extra five grand, uh, sorry, not a month, a year, an extra five grand a year is going to make a difference. But there's a limited pie. There's only a certain amount of dollars that you can squeeze out of this pie versus the alternative is instead of just squeezing more pennies out of this $40,000 pie, what if you can take your $40,000 pie and turn it into a $400,000 pie? Now, if you live by the same metrics where you're putting aside 25%, that's $100,000. That's a lot more than the extra five grand that you'd have to squeeze out of your $40,000 pie, but you're living by the same metrics. You're still living off of 75% of what you make. Now, at first, you're gonna hear that and say, Jaspreet, how in the world am I gonna go from 40 grand to $400,000? Like, that's impossible. And I can tell you that if you say it's impossible, if you say it's not possible, if you say that somebody like you can't go from 40 to 400, you're 100% right. It's going to be impossible for you because your mindset is what's blocking you. But when you believe it's possible, you actually believe that somebody like you can earn more money, that somebody like you can achieve success and wealth, then what are you gonna do? You're gonna start putting in work. You're gonna, stay in, you're gonna start taking action. Again, I'm not saying that as soon as you start thinking, I'm gonna earn more money, that it's gonna magically show up, that your boss is gonna bump up your salary from 40,000 to $400,000. That's not what I'm saying. We're not talking about magic here. We're talking about actual actionable steps where now you might go to YouTube and start watching videos on how do you earn more money. Maybe you start learning about how do you build a side hustle. Maybe you start learning about how do you build a business idea. Then maybe you start reading some books. You invest $100 to get five to 10 of the best business books that you can find on Audible and Amazon, and you just start reading these books. I can promise you that if you read these books, now you're gonna become more educated about business, especially if you're reading the books that are the top sellers, the top business books out there. They're very easy to find. Just go and start reading them. It does not matter which ones, just start learning. Because as you start learning, you're gonna start reading and realizing that maybe you like marketing, maybe you like sales, maybe you like uh, something else. You're gonna see what you like and you're gonna start learning more about that. Now you start taking it one step deeper. Maybe you start buying classes. And along the way, maybe you start your own product. Maybe you start selling your own thing. Maybe you start your own agency and now you start to make some money. Maybe you become a freelancer and you start doing this. And then three months later, you realize you did the wrong thing. You lost $100, $500, $1,000. You're doing the wrong thing. And now you're taking two steps backwards, but your mindset is 10 steps forward. You have learned so many things along the way. You feel like you're starting over because financially, you put in some work, you started, you lost some money, and now you're trying to start over but you are so much further than where you were before because you understand so much more and now you can go so much further because you have gone through that learning process. These mistakes, these failures are the real life tuition that you have to pay in order to become successful. Every single successful person out there has gone through their fair share of failures. Like I started Minority Mindset because I got scammed and screwed over when I was launching a different business. And this is where now you have to understand, okay, you're putting in that work, you have the mindset, you're putting in the action to earn more money, and now that you're starting to earn more money, what do you do with that money? 
Now we go back to that same formula that I laid out just a little bit ago. Income minus expenses equal your investments plus your savings. How do you become wealthy? You ramp up your investments. So we talked about how to limit your expenses. Now the next thing that we're doing now is you are ramping up your income. Now as you're making more money from your income, you don't want to just magically inflate your expenses. You don't want to just start inflating your lifestyle just because you're earning more money because now that's going to put you back into the same situation that you were in before. You're going to go back to living paycheck to paycheck because a paycheck to paycheck lifestyle is not a byproduct of how much money you're making. It's a byproduct of the mindset that you have because you have people that are paycheck to paycheck living off of 30 grand a year and you have people that are paycheck to paycheck living off of 300 grand a year and you have people that are paycheck to paycheck making $3 million a year. Now, you might hear that and say, how in the world is somebody making $3 million a year living paycheck to paycheck? Well, it happens all the time. It happens all the time because making money is very different than managing money. Some people can be very good at making money, but horrible at managing money. And some people can be very good at managing money, but very good. And some people can be very good at managing money and very bad at making money. Managing money and making money are two completely separate things, but managing money is what can help you get and become wealthy, and it can help you stay wealthy. Making money will help you become wealthy faster, but it's not going to help you stay wealthy unless you know how to manage your money. And this is where you have to understand how they both play a part side by side to build each other up. And this is why I keep saying that your financial education is what's so, so, so important. Because at the end of the day, I talk about this, I feel like a lot now. But the way the system is designed, there's a lot of things that are out there that profit out of people being financially poor. There's a lot of things and entities that profit out of you being financially uneducated. There's a lot of things that benefit out of keeping you financially stupid. It's the reality. Now we can hate it, cry it, complain about it, scream about it, but spending all of our energy and time hating the system isn't going to change the system and it isn't going to make you wealthy. So spend your 10 minutes upset, angry, ranting, now spend the rest of your time, 23 hours a day, 23 hours and 50 minutes a day, now actually doing something about it. That way now you can become wealthy despite the system because it is possible. No matter where you come from, no matter who your parents are, no matter what degree you have, if you don't have a degree, no matter what salary you have, no matter what your circumstances are, yes, it is going to be harder for some people than others, but it's not impossible. But it requires you now to be willing to put in the work, get financially educated, and then actually make it happen. If you are looking for some simple ways to save an extra thousand dollars quickly, you are in the right place. What we're seeing happen right now is that more and more people are running out of money as credit card debt is rising and the majority of Americans do not have a thousand dollars saved up. Now, the thing that you want to understand about this is if you don't have a thousand dollars saved up, I like to say two thousand dollars, but if you do not have a thousand dollars saved up, you are in a financial danger zone because if any little life thing happens, you're going to end up deeper in credit card debt. You're going to end up in a deeper financial hole, and it's going to make it many times harder for you to dig yourself out and actually start building wealth. So what I want to do today is go over 10 different steps or 10 different hacks that you can use to save some extra money that we can put aside at least a thousand dollars. You want to have at least $2,000 saved up, but in order to have $2,000, you're going to have your first $1,000 saved up. You need to put aside at least a thousand dollars that we have some financial cushion to protect you against life's emergencies. So to start, let's start by talking about number one, which is no more financing anything, period. The difference between a broke person and a rich person when it comes to spending money is a broke person says, oh, I can make the $50 a month payment so I can afford to buy that cell phone. A wealthy person says, I can afford to buy that $1,000 phone so I can actually afford it. It's two very different things. Being able to make the monthly payments is not being able to afford it. And we live in a culture today where financing things is very normal. In fact, paying outright cash for something like a phone or a car is considered abnormal because the majority of people are now financing everything in their lives and now thanks to buy now pay later or as i like to call it broke now broke later it has become even easier for you to finance things like your clothes and even your groceries so now if you don't want to be like the majority of people who are broke who don't have a thousand dollars saved up you can't keep doing what the majority of people do and that means for one you have to stop 
buying things that you cannot afford. That means you have to stop financing things in order to buy them. And that means you're going to have to make some sacrifices. That means, number one, maybe you don't get to buy all the stuff that you thought you can afford. And number two, when you go to actually buy the stuff, maybe you don't buy the newest and nicest thing. If you want to buy a phone, okay, maybe you can't afford a $1,000 phone. Maybe you have to go out and purchase a $200 used phone. And this means now you're going to have to downsize not just what you're buying, but how many things that you're buying because you can no longer keep financing things that are not putting money in your pocket. And that means you're going to have to start spending money on less things and buying less stuff. Number two is stop paying dumb fees. This one's going to come off harsh, but you need to understand this. Banks love it. They love it when you are financially stupid. And the reason why is because if you're financially stupid, you're going to go out and spend money that you don't have. Now, if you spend money you don't have, not only are you going to have to pay interest on that, we talked about that point number one, but then number two is you're going to have to pay overdraft fees and you're going to have to pay other penalties and fines, which are free money for banks. That means you're going to have to pay money because you spent money you didn't have, not just an interest, but because you didn't have that money in your bank account. And these dumb fees are making banks, not millions, but billions of dollars each and every single year. And the reason why so many people are paying this is because they don't realize that they're spending money that they don't have. And so what you can do now is number one, control your spending. And number two, check your bank account. And number three, if you do accidentally overspend on your bank account, what I want you to do is call up the bank and tell them, hey, I accidentally overspent. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. I've had a good record with you. Can you please waive my overdraft fee? A lot of people are paying overdraft fees when you can just ask for it to get waived. And guess what? Most banks will waive your first overdraft fee for you, sometimes even the second. So just ask. The worst they can say is no. And so now, if you want to stop overpaying on fees, the first thing you can do is stop paying this overdraft fee. The second thing I want you to do is... If you are paying money to cash your checks, stop doing that. Open up a bank account. And the reason why I bring this up is I used to guest teach in Detroit public schools. And these high schoolers who were hardworking kids, many of them were working jobs and they did not have a bank account, which meant they were getting paid with a physical check. Then they would take this physical check to a liquor store to cash the check. And then the liquor store owner would charge them a 1% to 10% fee to cash that check. If you're paying money to access your own money, there is a problem here. And there's a simple and free way to bypass that. And that means go and open up a bank account for free and then use that bank to cash your checks or deposit your checks. That way you don't have to keep paying money to access your own money. The third dumb fee that I want you to stop paying are payroll advance fees. This has been a booming industry recently with payroll companies, pay loan companies, a bunch of different types of companies now extending you your payroll advances for a teeny tiny little fee. And all that means is instead of you waiting until Friday to get your money, you can get your money on Monday or you can get your money a week in advance and just pay a little bit of money in fees. But these fees compound. And if you look at how much these fees actually cost on an annual basis, it is more than what your credit card is costing you. In fact, sometimes it's multiples of what your credit card is costing you in APR. So what I want you to do now is understand you got to wait until your paycheck if you want to go out and spend that money. And that means you got to start controlling your money and controlling your spending until your next paycheck because that's going to allow you to keep way more money in your account because if you get into this habit of constantly spending next week's paycheck today, well, you're going to start digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into a financial hole that can get harder and harder to get out. And the fourth and last dumb fee that I want you to stop paying are late fees. Late fees really, really irritate me. And the reason why they irritate me is because they are a fee that you're paying for no purpose. You're getting no additional value. You're getting nothing except you forgot to pay a bill on time. And because you forgot to pay a bill on time, you got to pay an additional 35 bucks just because you are late. So what I want you to do is get in schedule with your bills. Look at what you got to pay. Put it in your Google calendar if you need to. Put a sticky note on it. Put it on your forehead. Put it on your fridge. I don't care where you put it. Just pay your bills on time. And if you make a mistake, because I've made mistakes as well with late fees, you better call them up and tell them, hey, I'm sorry, this has never happened before. Can you please waive my late fee? A little tip here when you're talking to customer service reps is be nice. Because if you're aggressive and angry and upset with them, they're going to be aggressive and angry and upset with you, and they're not going to be very nice to your wallet. Customer service reps are dealing with angry and upset customers all day and night long. So if you're nice to them, they will be nice to your wallet. But just explain to them that you made a mistake. Because mistakes happen. That's a part of life. But that doesn't mean you necessarily have to pay for that mistake. If you're nice, 
Many times they will waive that fee for you. Now you get to keep more money in your pocket. The third thing that I want you to do if you do not have $1,000 saved up is you got to stop eating out. Now, I want you to understand this. The goal isn't for you to not eat out and eat restaurants and eat Starbucks for the rest of your life. But there is a time and place to make that sacrifice. If you do not have $1,000 in your bank account, you should not be seeing the inside of a restaurant. You should not be walking inside of Starbucks unless you're going there just to hang out with somebody else and not eat. Now, I took this to an extreme for a long time because what I used to do was I did not want to spend money at restaurants because I wanted to keep that money in my pocket. So what I used to do was I would go to restaurants with my friends, sit there and drink water, and that's it. And so if you want to now start saving some of that money, stop overpaying by going to a restaurant. Stop overpaying by going to Starbucks. These things are entertainment. And if you don't have $1,000, and really, if you don't have $2,000, you should not be worried about entertainment right now. What you got to do is you got to get that $2,000 saved, but you need the $1,000 first. So let me stick with that, which means you cannot be going to restaurants. You should not be going to Starbucks. You should not be spending your money on this type of entertainment until you are out of that financial danger zone. Number four is no more shopping. That means no more going to the mall. No more going to Macy's. No more going to Amazon.com. Block that website if you need to. Do not go out and spend money because right now, again, you are in a financial danger zone. This means you got to keep as much money in your pocket as possible. That way you can save up this $1,000 and then the $2,000. But the fastest way for you to do that is just to stop letting this money leave your account. And that means you're going to have to stop shopping. If you do not need it to survive you should not be spending money on it. And needing something to survive doesn't mean that you shouldn't eat blueberries. It means you shouldn't be eating the organic blueberries right now because right now you got to get that $1,000 saved up as fast as possible, which also ties into point number five, which is the 24-hour rule. This is something that I like to talk about, which is if you go somewhere and you see something that you feel like you really want, something that you feel like you really need, but you're not sure yet, one thing that you can do to stop those impulse purchases is follow what I like to call the 24-hour rule, which is give yourself 24 hours to decide if you really need it. You'll go to the store, you find a sweater that you really like, but you don't buy it. You got to follow this 24-hour rule, which means you got to give yourself this discipline, which says now, I'm not going to buy this sweater today, but I'm not going to say no to buying it. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go home and I'm going to sleep on it. And then if tomorrow I wake up and I still realize I need that sweater, I want that sweater, then I'm going to make it okay for me to go out and purchase it. This way, you're not saying no to all purchases, but you can slow down your impulse purchases because maybe you're going to forget about it. Maybe you realize in the morning, you know what? I don't want to overpay for that sweater. Maybe I can wait next month. Maybe I can wait a few months. Maybe I don't need a sweater. And this way you can cool down those impulse purchases because impulse purchases are an easy way for you to find an easy extra few hundred dollars a month because everybody is making impulse purchases. And if you can cool those down, it's going to increase your bank account. Number six is stop overpaying for things. There are a whole bunch of extensions on the internet that are free Chrome extensions, free Google extensions that if you download them, they will automatically find coupons when you're shopping online. And it's the same thing when you go to stores. There are platforms, there are apps out there. I'm not going to go through which ones because there are so many and they're changing all the time. Just do a quick Google search. There are so many apps out there that will find coupons for you. My wife loves doing this. If we're going shopping in the mall and we're standing in line, what she'll do is she'll just go to Google and search Macy's coupons or whatever we are. And what you'll find sometimes, or actually a lot of times, is there are 10% off coupons, 15% off coupons that are just there that if you spend 30 seconds looking for them, you'll find this little coupon. And now instead of paying $100, you spend $90 or $85 just because you spent those 30 seconds while you're in line looking for a coupon. So don't overpay for things if you don't have to, because if there's a coupon out there, use it. Number seven is negotiate your bills lower. A big difference between the spending culture in India and the spending culture in America is in India, you negotiate the price of everything. You go walk into the bazaar, or you go walk into the streets and you want to buy some groceries, you're going to negotiate the price of your apples. If you go to America, you walk into whatever Whole Foods, you're not going to negotiate the price of apples. So it is not normal in American culture to really negotiate the price of things. However, you do have the ability to negotiate, especially the prices of summer utility bills, things like your internet bill, things like your phone bill, things like your cable bill. Many times these service companies are going to keep increasing the price of your bill year after year after year, and they just hope that you keep blindly paying the fees. But... Many times you can save 10, 15, sometimes 30% on your bills by just calling up these companies and nicely telling them that their competitors are charging a much lower rate. And you're thinking about leaving because now you're shopping around and you really want to stay and you've been a loyal customer for two years just wanting to see if there's anything they can do to work with you on the price. 
And again, when you're nice, many times these customer service reps will be nice back to your wallet, but all you have to do is ask. And it's funny, I've gotten this, this little tip has come back to me in many ways because I've gotten so many comments and messages and DMs from people saying, oh my God, Jasprit, I didn't think that this tip was going to work and now I'm saving an extra $50, $75, one person said $300 a month just by implementing this little tip. So just go out and try it. If you have these these service and utility bills, just call them and ask. You have nothing to lose because the worst thing that they can say is no. And before I move on to number eight, I do want to let you know that I know some of you are asking or wondering, how can we start putting our money to work? Well, the first thing I want you to do before you start putting your money to work, before you start worrying about investing your money and growing your money is I need you to save this first couple thousand dollars. Then I want you to focus on paying down your high interest credit card debts. After that is when you want to be worried about investing your money and growing your money. Now, for that, we have a free ebook on how to build wealth as an investor. My team at Briefs Media put this together. It's a completely free ebook that walks you through the basics of how to start investing, how do you generate cash flow, the different ways that you start investing, and it gets into the advanced stuff of things like how do you protect your assets. The ebook is completely free. So if you want to get a copy of this ebook, I got the link to how you can download this ebook down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash ebook. Number eight is have a place to store your cash. And I do not mean under your mattress. What I want you to do is I want you to open up a bank account, not just for your spending money. If you don't have a bank account yet, make sure you open one up. But I want you to have a bank account just for your savings. This is a bank account that will keep your emergency savings cash that you only use if you run into a financial emergency. And the reason why you want to keep these separate is because what ends up happening is if you keep all of your money in one bank account is it's very easy to accidentally spend your savings money. You go to the store, you see that sale on a TV, you see the sale on a new handbag or whatever it is that you want to buy, and then you realize, oh, I got $1,500 in my bank account. I can afford or can purchase this thing, but this is where you want to make sure you keep that money separate that we don't accidentally spend your savings money. Now, the nice thing about today at the time we were recording is that you had a lot of high-interest savings accounts that are paying 3 4 5% a year in interest on your savings. So, What you can do right now is look for a savings account, ideally a high interest savings account, open that up. And now as you start finding this extra cash, put this money there and don't touch it unless you absolutely need it. This is your emergency money because you want to use this money when something goes wrong. So you don't have to worry about going into credit card debt. But you want to make sure you keep it somewhere else and just take advantage of the higher interest rates with a higher interest savings account. That way, at least your savings can earn you a little bit of money as well. Number nine, if you want to accelerate your path to getting that extra thousand dollars, you got to get some extra money as well. And the most accessible way to do that is just by putting in some extra work. If you're working a job, see if you can put in some extra hours. See what you got to do to get a raise. See what you got to do to get a promotion. See what you got to do to get a bonus. Ask your boss. Say, boss, listen. I have this financial struggle I'm going through. I'm not asking you for a handout, but I want to put in some extra work that way I can get this extra thousand dollars. Is there something that I can do to make a little bit of extra money? And just ask. Maybe they'll say no. Maybe they'll say yes. But even if they say no, keep putting in the extra work because that way when it comes time for your raise or your promotion or your bonus, you are the person that's been putting in the extra work and the extra hours that way you can get that extra money. But the key here is now when you start making the extra money, don't keep blowing the money the way that you were before because now it's time for you to build your wealth upwards instead of digging yourself into a financial hole like you've been doing. And that means now you want to work to earn more money so you have more money to make yourself wealthy. And this brings me to number 10, which is the most different than the rest. But if you really really want to get out of the financial situation of you living paycheck to paycheck and worrying about money, the best return on investment that you can make right now is to cancel your Netflix subscription. And it's not so you can save those $15 a month. It's so you can save those two to three hours a day of time that you're watching TV. And if you really want the brutal, honest truth, if you don't have $1,000 or even $2,000 saved up in your savings account, You should not feel comfortable watching Netflix. You should not feel okay sitting down on the sofa watching TV if you are in that financial danger zone. Right now, you got to have the fire on your butt that, oh my God, I'm in a financial danger zone. I have no savings. I have credit card debt. I have these financial issues that I got to get myself out of. This is not the time for you to be sitting on the sofa trying to relax. And you might say, but just I'm working so hard at my job. I need some time to come home and relax. Fine. You want to relax? Do that after you got a couple thousand dollars. Do that after you pay down your credit card debt. Until then, you need a fire on your butt because the reality is 
Sacrifice has got to be made when the sacrifice has got to be made. And if you are in a financial danger zone, you should not be worried about watching TV. Now, the reason why I say canceling the Netflix is going to give you the best return on your investment is because if you can convert those two to three hours a day, and the reason why I say two to three hours a day is because the average American is watching almost three hours of television a day. If you can convert those almost three hours of TV time a day to learning time or building time, this is going to allow you to not only earn more, but build more wealth because you can use this time to read books. Use this time to watch classes. Use this time to listen to educational podcasts. If you use this time to learn, it's going to allow you to earn way more. And this is going to allow you to build more wealth because the reality is most people who earn more end up broke because they don't know what to do with their money. But now if you can start working on that financial education, you start reading the right financial education, you start absorbing the right financial education. Now, as you earn more, you're going to be able to leverage those earnings to build you even more wealth. And that's the key to becoming really sustainably wealthy and building the generational wealth is not only do you have to earn the money, but you have to know how to keep and grow that money. And there's a whole different skill set. And that's where I want you to start investing your time into that education because you have to spend your time to learn how to do that. And again, we have a free ebook at Briefs Media down in the description that can walk you through how to start building that financial education. But that requires you to put in the effort and to invest that time to actually start putting the education to work. If you have $1,000 sitting in the bank and you're trying to figure out the best way to grow this $1,000 into $2,000, the best thing for you to do is not put this money into the stock market. I'll show you. See, if you have $1,000 sitting in your savings account right now, you have a few different options of what you can do. Number one is you take this $1,000, you go to the mall, and you buy yourself a new watch. That's spending the money, but now this $1,000 is going to slowly go down to zero. So you're essentially throwing this money in the garbage. Yeah, you got a nice watch, but that watch is not going to appreciate in value. It's going to go down in value. Option number two is you can save this money. Now, if you take this $1,000 and you put it into a high interest savings account that's paying, let's just say 5% in interest, now you're going to generate $50 over the course of a year. Not a ton of money, but better than nothing. It's better than spending that money. But the third option is you can invest this money. And this is where most people think, oh, well, you can put this money into the stock market or you can put it into real estate, although you're not going to be able to buy a rental property with $1,000 in today's market. So if you put this money into the stock market, now you're trying to grow this money by 7 to 10% a year. That has been the historical average when you invest your money into the stock market. So let's assume you can get a 10% return on the $1,000 investment. That means you invest $1,000 into the stock market. After one year, you are going to make a hundred dollars of profit. The problem with that is you don't actually make the hundred dollars until you sell your stock, which means you have to sell it, you gotta pay taxes, and then you only get that eleven hundred dollars, but you no longer have an asset. But then the second problem with that is the hundred dollars isn't a ton of money, it's not gonna change your lifestyle either. So now the question is, well, how else can you put this money to work and get a return that's going to make you real wealth? That's going to allow you to make even more money that we can have more money to invest because there's nothing wrong with investing your money into the stock market or the real estate market. I want you to be investing your money into these types of passive assets, but I also want you to build true wealth with these passive assets because the way that it works when you invest your money into the stock market is you got to make the money. And then the money you make is going to work to earn you more money. The more money you earn, the more wealth you will build. Because if you make, now, instead of $1,000, $100,000, and now you can take this $100,000 and put it into the stock market. Well, now, a 10% return is $10,000. If you make a million dollars and you put this money into the stock market, now a 10% return is $100,000. So you can start to see where that same 10% return starts to become a lot more valuable when you have more dollars to invest. This is why a lot of people say, oh, it takes money to make money. No, that's not true. It takes money to grow your money, but it doesn't take money to make money. And so when it comes to growing your money with these passive assets, stocks and real estate, they are there to grow your money. If you can invest $1,000 a week or $1,000 a month, now you can really start to grow that money because now you're making money and now you can grow that money and that's where true wealth is built. I don't want you to stop doing that. That's great. But if you only got $1,000 to invest, what you need to do is figure out how you can take this $1,000 that you have right now and grow it that way now you can take $1,000 every week or every month and put this money into the stock market. How can you take the $1,000 that you have and multiply it so now you can take $1,000 every month and keep throwing that into the stock market? What can you do with this $1,000 today to make that happen? 
That's what you need to be figuring out how you can invest that money today. Because if you just put that thousand dollars into the stock market today and you don't touch it, well, yeah, you can grow it a little bit. But remember, the stock market and the real estate market are there to grow the money that you've already worked to create. And if you want to be able to grow your money faster and grow more money, you need more money to invest. And this is where, going back to what I said just a second ago, it's important to remember it takes money to grow your money, but it doesn't take money to start earning that money. If you got $1,000 right now, the question is, how can you take that $1,000 and invest it in a way that's going to earn you more money? And this could be investing this money into your education, or this could be investing your money into your income. Now, the way you invest into your education is pretty straightforward. Take this $1,000 and now invest it into classes, books, seminars, coaching, something that's going to allow you to earn more money. Now, before you go out and you spend this money, I do want to give you a little bit of caveat because the last thing that you want to do is just throw this into any sort of class or education or coaching on the internet, and then you find out this wasn't right for you. So start with the free information out there. Go out and watch free YouTube videos, listen to free podcasts, and then start reading some books. You got to kind of progress down this in a more gradual way because you want to make sure that you're putting this money into something that's going to actually drive you and deliver you some value. So start with the free content, YouTube, podcast, blogs, see what it is that you want to learn more about. Maybe you want to build a personal brand. Maybe you want to build your own business. Maybe you want to get a certificate in data science. I don't know. You figure out where it is that you want to invest more of your time and your money, and then you take it one step further. Before you go out and you spend that $1,000 on some expensive coaching or some expensive class, go out and buy a couple books. Spend 50 bucks and go buy as many books as you can on that topic and then read it. If you don't read it, well, then what makes you think that you're going to now get a better return by go buying a class that takes even more work and more action in your part? If you can't read the book, you're not going to be willing to put in the work on the more intense and work ethic stuff. So now go buy a couple of books, spend $50 buying a couple of books or a few books on whatever that topic is and then read them. And if after those books you are still interested and you're still excited about this thing, that's where now you can start investing more of this money into your education. Now you can look at classes, coaching, seminars, whatever it is, conferences. Look into ways to keep expanding your knowledge, but also doing something on this topic. If it's building your personal brand, you better keep making content. If it's building your data science certificate, well, then you got to start working to get that certificate and figure out what you can do with that certificate. If it's building your own business, then you got to start thinking of business ideas and you got to start implementing it. And this is where now what you're doing is you're investing in your brain because if you can invest the $1,000 into learning how you can earn more money, well, now that's where now you're working to earn more money so you have more money to invest. Remember, the key with earning money is not to buy a faster car. The key with earning money is to own more assets so your assets can buy you the faster car. You want to make money to own more cash flow because the cash flow can then fund your lifestyle. And I want you to have whatever nice stuff that you want. I'm not saying don't buy a nice car. I'm not saying don't have a big home. I'm not saying don't have the luxury designer stuff. I'm saying afford it first. And if you really want to be able to afford it and be completely financial free, that means you're using your assets to pay for it for you. You're not working to earn money to buy the nice car. You're working to own assets that pay for the nice car. The alternative thing that you can do is you can invest this money into your own business idea. If you want to work to build your personal brand, then maybe you go out and buy a camera or you go out and buy some lights. But I do want to caution you with this as well because most of the time, 99% <clears throat> of the time, you can go out and get started and start building your business, your brand, your product with very little amounts of money. I started my Minority Mindset show, this entire YouTube channel, with less than $500. And I say $500 to be very gracious, but I know it was significantly less than that. I didn't have a fancy camera when I got started. I didn't have fancy lighting when I got started. I, I had my cell phone, my iPhone that I had, and then I had a tripod that I bought off of Amazon. I think I paid $25 for the tripod, and that was it. I don't have any fancy microphones. I don't have any fancy editing equipment. I don't have anything. I used my $25 tripod. I think I might have bought a $25 light as well. So maybe let's just say 50 or 60 bucks to get started with the equipment. I recorded the videos off of my cell phone with no mic or anything, 
and then I edited it on the free editing software that my computer had, and then I uploaded it to YouTube. And I kept doing that until I started to get more views and started to get some revenue. And then when I got some revenue, that's when I bought my first camera. And that's when I bought my first lights. And then I went out and bought my first microphone. And that was a tough purchase because microphones are expensive. But it wasn't until I started making money that I started really spending money. And this is a mindset that you really have to shift because most people assume oh man, I can't go out and do this because everybody's got all this fancy stuff and everyone's spending all this money on advertising and this and that to get started. Well, the reality is you don't need a ton of money to get started. It's not the tool set that you lack, it's the mindset. And this is where your mindset is really going to determine what trajectory that you're going to have in business and your income. Because if you want everything today and you're not willing to put in the hustle and the work to get it, well, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to actually put in the reps to get the success because building business is hard. Building a business takes time. Building a business takes effort. Building a business takes risk. It took me a long time to build my brand on the Minority Mindset Show. And then I had to figure out how can I build a business because I am an entrepreneur. I didn't really just want to be a creator. I've always had this entrepreneurial mind where I want to be a business owner and I want to run a company because that's something that I enjoy. Not everybody wants to do that. And so I would try a lot of different things. And I was running businesses before the Minority Mindset Show and I was investing in real estate before. But for me now, it was I'm building this content. This is fun. It was a hobby at first. But then I wanted to turn it into a business because I was spending so much time into creating this personal brand. So first I started with building a blog, which failed. And then I had the idea to build the Briefs Media brand. Now, again, if you wanted to go out and start a media company, generally it would cost a ton of money. And most people have to then go out and either raise debt or you go out and raise investment capital, venture capital from investors. But I was able to self-fund it because now I could take the revenue that I was making from my YouTube brand, my personal brand, and funnel that here into the Briefs Media brand. And then we were able to grow Briefs Media from a free news editor to then our whole other platform of things that we're working to build. But all of these things were like baby steps that built on top of one another. And even before the YouTube channel, I mean, I was doing so many things before I got to YouTube. And so now the question is, how can you now start taking action? And the difficult part here is a lot of people assume that you have to be perfect. You have to find the right thing. You have to find the right idea. You have to find the perfect item to do. But that's not how it works. Perfection can be the enemy of great. And this is where now the key is you just got to get started. And if you do something that you no longer want to do, you can always pivot. But I guarantee you're going to learn something. I started off in event planning. That was my first business. Then I got into real estate. By real estate, I don't just mean investing in real estate. I was doing that. But I also got my real estate salesperson's license. I also became a real estate wholesaler. Then I got onto the internet. I started selling on Amazon. Then I started my own e-commerce store. And after that, after doing all this and investing in real estate, I then got on the internet with my YouTube channel. And so it's progressions. You got to figure out what kind of path you can take and what is going to be right for you. And what's right for you is going to evolve, but you got to get started and you got to just keep putting in the reps and you can't keep just trying to be perfect because if you're constantly just trying to find the right thing to do, you're going to be waiting forever. And this is where you just got to get started. You're going to learn along the way, but you got to start putting in action. So if you got the thousand dollars, the question is now, how can you take the $1,000 and turn it into something that's going to pay you at least $1,000 a month that you can invest into the stock market or into some other asset class? That way now you can continue to build that wealth, but you have to figure out how you can grow that first $1,000 in the first place. If your goal is to generate quote-unquote passive income, then one of the most accessible ways to do that is by investing your money into dividend-paying stocks. But most people are investing in dividend stocks the wrong way. When most people think about investing in dividends, they're looking for a company that's paying out the highest dividend because the highest dividend means the biggest paycheck that you're going to get without having to do any work. And that makes sense in theory, but it doesn't always work out the way that you expect. Let me show you what I mean. The AT&T company has been known as one of the best dividend paying stocks for a number of years. But even if they're paying out strong dividends like they're doing at the time of recording this video, if the stock chart looks like this, that can make you nervous as an investor. 
Now, I'm not saying if AT&T is a good stock or a bad stock. What I'm saying is if your goal is to be a dividend investor, there are some tricks that you can use to find good investments that will allow you to generate cash flow without having to consistently keep monitoring your investments because the goal isn't just to generate cash flow, it's to own a good asset that's hopefully growing in value that's also growing in the cash flow that you're generating. So if your goal is to supplement or completely replace your job income with your dividend income, let me go over a couple tricks that you can use to lower some of your potential risk as an investor. That way you can continue to get steady and healthy cash flow from your investments. Now, of course, investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point. So make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. And of course, all the stocks and funds that I discussed today are just as examples. They are not recommendations. Strategy number one is to look at a company's dividend history. Now, while this cannot perfectly guarantee what's going to happen in the future, it can give you some sort of idea of what a company's done in the past. Let me show you. In the dividend game, you have different categories or classes of dividend paying companies. For example, you have dividend achievers, dividend champions, and dividend kings. And all these do is kind of just categorize stocks based off of how long they've been paying out dividends and for how long they've been increasing their dividends over the past. So for example, a company becomes a dividend achiever if they have paid out and increased their dividend every year for at least the last 10 years. A company becomes a dividend champion if they have paid out and increased their dividend every year for at least the last 25 years. And a company becomes a dividend king if they have paid out and increased their dividend every year over the last 50 years. Now you can see that it becomes a little bit more difficult as you go down this list, but now you can start to do your research by looking at companies that have been paying out and increasing their dividends year after year after year. Now you might be wondering, but just breathe. how do I go out and find a dividend achiever or a dividend king? How do I actually do this research? Well, thankfully, there's this amazing research tool that is actually free called Google. And you can just go to Google and search dividend achievers and you will see a list of dividend achievers in the stock market. Or you could search for dividend champions and you'll see a list of dividend achievers in the stock market. Or you can search dividend kings and you will see a list of dividend kings in the stock market. Now again, you don't want to just blindly throw your money into a company because they've been paying out and increasing a dividend. That's just the first part of your research. But this can give you a little bit of a guideline of if you are looking for a company that has been paying out and increasing the dividends because you want future growth in your dividends, this could be at least some sort of basic starting point for you because if a company has been paying out and increasing the dividends, that could potentially mean that they are a strong company and they are focused on providing steady and strong cash flow to their investors. Will this guarantee you make a good investment? Absolutely not but at least it gives you a starting point. The second strategy that you can consider is not investing into a dividend paying company, but rather invest into a dividend paying fund. Because if you are not interested in this whole game of trying to keep up with a company, researching a company, studying their earnings, and making sure that this company is still a strong company, because sometimes companies do fail, sometimes companies go bankrupt, and if you keep investing your money into a fund for a number of decades, trying to build this cash flow, and then they go bankrupt, not only do you lose their cash flow, but you lose all the money that you invested but there is a way to mitigate some of that risk by now investing your money into a dividend paying fund. Now you can invest your money into a fund that's paying you a dividend and this fund could be made up of dozens or hundreds of companies that way if one of the companies in the fund goes bankrupt, well, it's balanced out by the other winners. So it's a way for you to reduce some of your risk and now you can also mitigate some of your time because you can set up a system where not every week or every two weeks or every month, you're just putting a little bit of money into this fund and now you don't have to keep up with the fund the way that you would if you were investing your money into an individual company because investing your money into individual companies comes with more risk, it comes with more time and you need a little bit more experience if you really want to make money and analyze your investments as opposed to just putting your money into a fund. So let me give an example of what this looks like. So. PFM, again, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just giving you some examples. PFM is an ETF that gives you exposure to dividend aristocrats. Now, if you remember what I said just a minute ago, dividend aristocrats are companies that have paid out and increased their dividends for at least the last 10 years. So now you can look at the list of dividend aristocrats and find some companies that you want to invest in, or you can just invest in dividend aristocrats by investing into this fund like PFM, and now you're getting exposure to dividend aristocrats, and you don't have to put in the work to try to find the best company. Now, at the time I'm recording this video, the PFM ETF invests into about 400 companies. 
SPYD is an ETF that gives you exposure to dividend paying companies in the S&P 500. The S&P is a group of the 500 largest companies in the stock market. Now out of this group of the 500 largest companies in the stock market, not every single one of them pays a dividend. Maybe you just want to invest in the companies that are paying a dividend, now we can start generating some cash flow. Well, SPYD makes it easier for you because this is a fund that invests in companies in the S&P 500 that are paying out a dividend. At the time of recording this video, SPYD invests into 80 different companies. And then you have VYM, which I should put a little bit of an asterisk here because as a disclaimer, I do personally have some of my own money into VYM. This is an ETF created by Vanguard, which invests in dividend paying companies on the stock market inside of the United States. So it's a little bit broader than this and this, but at the time of recording this video, this has 462 companies in this fund. So now, if your goal is to generate cash flow and you want to build long-term cash flow, which means that now you're going to be consistently investing your money into these dividend-paying stocks, you can either invest your money into individual companies or you can invest your money into a fund. If you put your money into a company, well, now you run the risk of that company going bankrupt or something bad happening to the company or your stock price going down. But if you put your money into a fund, and there are many, 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 many other funds. This is just an example. There are many different funds out there depending on what it is that you want to invest in, what type of exposure that you want. Well, now you don't have that same level of risk. Is there still risk? Yes, but you're mitigating some of the risk because now you're investing in multiple companies. This is where now, if you really want to succeed as an investor, you want to dig a little bit deeper into the whole idea of dividends and why companies pay dividends. And before we jump into that, I do want to let you know that if you are interested in learning more about investing, my team at Briefs Media created this amazing ebook on how to build wealth as an investor that walks you through the basics of first, how do you build the mindset of an investor to getting into more of the complex and advanced stuff of different investing strategies. How do you generate cash flow? What are different cash flow ideas? How do you protect your assets? How do you spend your money smartly? This ebook is completely free. So if you want a breakdown of how to build wealth as an investor, this is a free guide that can help you with that. So if you want to read this ebook for free, I got the link to how you can download this ebook down in the description below. Now to understand how dividends really work, let's assume that a company makes $1 billion in revenue by selling their stuff. But this isn't all just profit, they have to have expenses. Like you have to have pay for your employees, you gotta pay for your rent, you gotta pay for your machinery costs and everything in between. And if now the cost of running this business is let's just say $500 million, that means this company at the end of the year will have $500 million in profit. This is cash that's sitting in their bank account at the end of the year. Now when the company, the stock, has this $500 million sitting in their bank account at the end of the year, there's three things that they could potentially do with this cash. Option number one is they save this cash for emergencies. Maybe they want to build in a rainy day fund because we remember when the pandemic happened, companies ran out of money very quickly. So one thing that a company could do is potentially save some of this money. Option number two is they can invest some of this money back into the company. Because now let's say this company wants to open new stores. It wants to open new manufacturing facilities. It wants to invest in research and development. It wants to open a new operation in Asia. Well, in order to do that, you need money. And if a company is trying to grow very quickly, they're gonna be very heavily investing this money back into the company. That's why you don't see a lot of startups paying out dividends, it's because they don't actually have any profit. They're investing all this money back into the company and some because they're going out and getting debt. They're trying to find more investors. That way they can grow as big as possible, as fast as possible. But then you have option number three, which is a company can give this money away. Now there's a couple of different ways that a company can give this money away. I'm not talking about giving it away to charity. I'm talking about giving it away to the shareholders, the people that own the stock. Now, the first way that this company can give this money away is by buying back some of their own stock. So if you have $500 million worth of profit, they can now go out and buy $500 million worth of their stock. Now, what does that do? Well, that helps inflate the stock price because if there's more buyers and sellers of the stock, well, then that pushes the stock price up. And the reason why some investors like that is because you don't actually see any cash in your pocket. Because if you just see the stock price of your investment go up, well, you don't have any taxable event because you only pay taxes when you sell or if you get some cash in your pocket. So if the company buys back their own stock, some investors prefer that because it's a way for you to make more money on paper because now your stock price is higher. However, the flip side of that is there's a chance that you don't actually see any of that money because then the stock price could go back down, anything could happen, and you don't actually see that money because you don't actually make any money until you sell your stock. 
So that's where the alternative is they can give it away in the form of a dividend. Now, when a company pays out a dividend, it's literally just a cash payment. It means the company is distributing checks, which nowadays are not checks. They deposit it directly into your brokerage account. The company is just distributing this money right into your account. And you don't have to do anything to really earn that money except own that stock or own that fund. And the nice thing about this is you can get paid without having to do any work because if you own a stock, you own a company that's paying out a dividend, all you have to do is own the company and now you're getting paid. But there are some cons with that because now you have a taxable event. When you get a dividend, you have to pay taxes on this money. Now you might think, but what if I take this money that I get from my dividend and I reinvest it back into the company or I reinvest it back into the fund, which is actually a really good strategy when it comes to building wealth, especially as a cash flow investor, because now not only are you contributing more money to buy more of this cash flow, but you're using your cash flow to buy more cash flow. It's a great opportunity and it's a great way for you to increase how much cash flow or passive income that some people like to call passive income. I prefer calling it a cash flow because passive income can kind of have a more of a deceptive title to it. But now, if you're generating this cash flow and you're reinvesting it, the goal is to generate more cash flow. However, even if you reinvest your dividends, you still have to pay taxes on that income, even if you never see it. So yeah, there is some downfalls to investing for dividends because you got to pay taxes, but at least you get that cash in your pocket today and you don't have to actually sell your stock to get any of the money. Personally, I like cash flow investing. For me, I like the security of having cash flow because for me, the game is to stack cash flow whether it's from stocks, whether it's from real estate, I want to stack the cash flow because now I know that this cash flow is going to keep coming in. And then my goal is to be able to live off of the cash flow because if I can use my cash flow to fund my entire lifestyle, well, now I'm financially free. I can do whatever I want and I can just keep living off of the cash flow. I can spend my money in whatever dumb way that I want. And I know I'm going to get another cash flow check next month or next quarter. Most companies and most funds that are paying out a dividend are paying out their dividends or their cash flow payments every quarter, meaning every three months. Now, the reason why it's really important for you to understand when you're investing for dividends, you're not just investing for the cash flow, you're investing in the underlying asset, is because sometimes that dividend that you're getting can be deceptive. Let me show you what I mean. Let's assume that you want to go out and invest in this XYZ company. I'm not saying this is an actual company, just an example. And at the time, this is trading for $100 a share and it's paying out a $5 dividend, which means it's paying out a 5% dividend yield. Not bad. But then something bad starts to happen in the company. They start to put out a bad product. People stop liking the company. And then the stock price falls to, let's just say, $50 a share. Now, if they haven't adjusted their dividend yet, that means this company is trading for $50 a share. Their dividend is $5, which means now they're not paying out a 5% dividend. They're paying out a 10% dividend. Now, at face value, this looks like a much more attractive investment because take a look, you're getting a 10% dividend as opposed to a 5% dividend. But it's not showing you the whole picture because if you look at the whole picture, what you see is, yeah, you're getting a 10% dividend, but the stock price has fallen by 50%. So maybe there's something majorly wrong with the company. If you feel like this is a great opportunity to come in and buy this company because they're going to turn it around and you're going to see the stock price soar, then sure, it could potentially be a good investment. Of course, it has risks, but what you want to understand is you are not just buying the cash flow you are buying the company and that's why it's so important that when you're doing your dividend analysis you look beyond just the percentage that you're getting you look beyond just a dollar amount that you're getting you look beyond just the share price you're looking at what the company is and how strong the company is and that's what should be deciding your investment decisions because you want to invest in the company, not just in the cash flow, because the cash flow number or percentage that you're seeing can be deceiving if you're just looking at that by itself, which is why that is just one piece of your investment decision. You want to look at the actual investment. That way you can make a smart decision for yourself. Now, when it comes to coming up with a strategy for how do you actually invest your money into cash flow producing assets or into stocks that are paying out dividends, one thing that I like to do, you gotta come up with the best strategy for you, is I have funds that I invest in for cash flow. I have ETFs that I invest in for cash flow. And for me, what I do is every Wednesday, cash is pulled out of my checkings account and it's automatically invested into my portfolio of ETFs. This happens automatically, this happens passively, and it happens consistently no matter what, whether the market's up, whether the market's down, this is gonna happen because I just wanna keep stacking the cash flow. Now, as I get my dividends, I just reinvest my dividends because I don't need my dividends right now. But that's the game that I'm doing. 
that money is automatically being invested for me and now I'm just constantly working to buy more cash flow. Every week, I own more cash flow producing ETFs. And now when my cash flow producing ETFs pay me with dividends, I use those to buy more cash flow producing ETFs. So it's become a machine where now I'm working to generate some income. My income is being used to buy some dividend paying ETFs and then my dividend paying ETFs are buying me more dividend paying ETFs. But of course, you gotta find the right strategy for you. But if you want to use your dividends to replace or supplement your income, you gotta get started. You got to figure out what it is that you want to invest in and then you got to come up with a strategy for you. Used when they look at real estate because they say, oh, I can buy this property for $150,000 today and maybe in a few years I'll be able to sell it for $300,000. And if they think like that, they'll be willing to overpay for the property because they have their eyes set on the future price appreciation. All they're looking at is how much can I sell this property for in the future. I don't do that. 